Hi, hi. Okay, so start of the fifth chapter. So, so very exciting. Getting near, uh, you know, getting near completion of the semester. Now, uh, the last section was uh, was optional. The section on the Laplace expansion. So, uh, so I'm going to cheat and reuse <laughs> the check-in from that. In fact, I'm going to cheat and reuse the, the what I wrote on the on the piece of paper. So here was the question. It asked about geometry of determinants. So some people may not have seen the geometry of determinants uh, uh, question. So uh, for each uh, sequence, and we're given two sequences, and a person notices that the difference is that we doubled the first of the two vectors in each. So to get from here to here, we double to get two, four. That's all. It just, just says uh, draw the boxes and find the volume. So uh, here's, uh, here's what I did for the optional. Uh, the, the optional, there's the A and A hat, and I drew the two boxes, and I'm not a very good drawer, I don't know what to tell you, but it's not the worst thing in the world either. So the, in, the first, uh, in the first box, you can see that it has a 1, 2, and 3, 1, and uh, here in this box over here, you can see that it has 2, 4, and again with the 3, 1. Uh, I've noted here in the picture that in going from 1, 2 to 3, 1, you're going you're going clockwise. Likewise here in going from 2, 4 to 3, 1, you're going clockwise. Okay? And I put in the whole parallelogram, the whole parallelogram. The uh, determinant here is uh, if you make if you make the sequence into a matrix and you take the determinant, you, I just use the formula for 2 by 2 matrices and got here minus 5. For a hat, same thing. I made it into a matrix, and I used the formula for two by two matrices, and I got here uh, minus ten, so uh, twice the size. And of course, looking up here, they have the same sign. We've already established that both of them are are clockwise, it, moving from the first vector to the second vector is clockwise. So the sense of both boxes is clockwise. And why why twice the uh, why twice the absolute value? Well, because uh, here we're looking at a box that has sort of twice the uh, twice the content, twice the measure. So from here to here, we've kind of doubled the kind of inside of the box. Okay, okay so very straightforward. So what happens in the fifth chapter is that we are going to need to uh, factor polynomials. So uh, so because we're going to factor polynomials, we need to. Um, uh, oops, there we go. Because we're going to factor polynomials, we need to uh, we need to change here to uh, away from using real numbers to using complex numbers. Real numbers are uh, are great in, uh, for what we've needed to do so far, linear combinations kind of stuff. But uh, for factoring polynomials, we really need to go to uh, really need to go to complex numbers. So I'm going to have a review here today, a brief review of factoring polynomials and uh, and complex numbers and how they connect. So we're going to use complex numbers for the scalars. So beyond real numbers, we're going to extend the real number case we've been working on so far to, to use complex numbers. And that will include, for example, entries in the vectors and the matrices. That is, we're going to shift from studying vector spaces over the real numbers to studying vector spaces over the complex numbers. You can do vector spaces over other mathematical structures. You just kind of need to be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. But but anyway, we're never going to do that in this uh, in this course. We're we're simply going to complex numbers is as far as we're going to go. Now, any real number is a complex number, of course. Yeah, five is five plus zero i, and and in this chapter, most of the examples that you'll see will be real numbers. But nonetheless, I can't state the critical theorems without without having the complex numbers around. Okay, so I'm going to briefly review factoring polynomials and complex numbers. So, uh, so the division theorem for polynomials, again, uh, I expect that a person has seen it before, but I'm reminding you, you might have saw it before and, and, uh, and it's kind of worked its way out of your working memory, but nonetheless, I think you see it before. So I want to think about a polynomial with a leading coefficient zero, just so that the n is not, uh, not foolish. A and then they say that the degree of the polynomial is n. If n is zero, then you have a constant polynomial. Constant polynomials that are not the zero polynomial, for example, the, the polynomial if I said p of x equals 7 or p of x equals minus 3 or p of x equals 1 plus i, that would be a constant polynomial that's not the zero polynomial. 
constant polynomials that are not the zero polynomial are defined to have degree zero, and the zero polynomial is defined to have degree negative infinity. To, to, it's just convenient for some statement of some theorem. Now, the point about polynomials here and division is that you can divide. So if you give me two polynomials, here I have a cubic polynomial and a quadratic polynomial, I can divide the quadratic into the cubic. The idea goes something like this. You ask yourself, just focus on the leading terms. At this point, it's the x squared and the 3x cubed. And you ask yourself, how many times does x squared go into 3x cubed? What does it take to multiply x squared to end up with a 3x cubed? So of course, it takes 3x. Now, just like long division in grade school, I'll multiply 3x times x squared plus x. I'll put it underneath and I'll subtract. So there's 3x times x squared plus x, and now I'm subtracting it away from the polynomial that's, that's inside here. And of course, the 3x cubed minus the 3x cubed is 0, of course, which was the whole point. And now I'm looking at 2x squared minus 3x squared, and, and I end up with minus x squared. Just like in grade school long division, you bring down the minus x. In fact, grade school long division is basically polynomial division, only you're using tens instead of x's. Anyway, you bring down the minus x and you now ask yourself, x squared goes into minus x squared. So just like a minute ago I was asking myself, x squared goes into 3x cubed how many times? Now I'm asking, x squared goes into minus x squared how many times? And I'm going through the steps. So x squared goes into minus x squared minus 1 times. I'll multiply through here. So I multiplied x squared plus x times minus 1 and subtracted. So there's a minus a minus thing happening there anyway, minus x squared x squared, and that cancels, and I'm looking at a minus x and a plus x, and it, it happens that I get a zero there. You bring down the four, and you got a four, so in short, how many times does x squared plus x go into 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus x plus 4? So the answer is x squared plus x goes this many times, 3x minus 1, into the 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus x plus 4, and what's the remainder? The remainder is 4. Writing it in the familiar n equals d cubed plus r form, there's the n, there's the d, there's the q, and there's the r. Okay, so where p is a polynomial, the, th the, the statement of, of the theorem that the example of which I just walked through, that where p is a polynomial, if d of x is a non-zero polynomial, the divisor, of course, if d of x is a non-zero polynomial, then there are quotient and remainder polynomials that give you p equals d q plus r. And the, as always with division, the point of division is, sure, the d q plus r is, 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 is there, and it's necessary for the statement, but often overlooked is the fact that the remainder has to be small. I mean, you know, what kind of person would say that 4 goes into 5, excuse me, 4 goes into 20, uh, 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 you know, 4 times with, uh, you know, uh, with, re with the remainder 4? Who would say that, you know? So you got to have that, that, that you got to have that the remainder is small. So here, the degree of R is strictly less than the degree of D. So you get dq plus r, all right, but the, the point is that the degree of r is strictly less than the degree of d. So uh, if you look, the corollary here specializes this to the case where you have degree 1 polynomials when, when you divide p by x minus lambda, so d is the divisor here, is x minus lambda, then, um, th then the answer's got to be the constant polynomial, so because that's the polynomial that has degree strictly less. Why does it have to be the constant polynomial r of x equals p of lambda? And the answer is just plug lambda in for everything, and that's what you get. Okay. If the divisor goes into the dividend evenly, meaning that r of x is the zero polynomial, then we say that d is a factor of p of x, just like with, with regular integers. If, uh, if, if 4 goes into 20 evenly, so we say that 4 is a factor of 20. Any root of the factor, a, any lambda, a, any real number, lambda, so that uh, d of lambda is 0, is a root of p of x, just from this equation here because r is 0, so you're just simply looking at d of lambda times q of lambda. 
okay? So if lambda is a root of the polynomial p of x, then x minus lambda divides p of x evenly. That is to say, if lambda is a root of the polynomial p of x, then x minus lambda is a factor of p of x. So we, we typically want to start with complicated polynomials, so let's say a 5th degree polynomial, a 12th degree polynomial, a 200th degree polynomial, uh, that's crazy. Of course, we're not going to see that kind of thing in this chapter. And break it down into smaller parts, and the smallest part here, the smallest part that involves an x, is x minus lambda. So we hope to take an arbitrary polynomial and break it into as many x minus lambdas as possible. Okay. Now, so when we were in the previous chapter, chapters 1 through 4, we were working with real numbers, and the factoring situation with real numbers is just a, a little bit more awkward, although kind of a lot more awkward, than with complex numbers, which is why we're going to switch. So I'm reminding you of the story with factoring with real numbers. If I give you a constant polynomial, you can't break it up into, into smaller things. It's into, into polynomials of smaller degree, that, that you, you just, because that's as small as you get. A linear polynomial, you can't break up into two smaller degree polynomials because linear is as of degree one. You can't make it any smaller. Quadratic polynomials, so a person in, uh, in you know, sort of junior high school, middle school, spends a certain amount of time factoring quadratic polynomials and finds that some of them factor and some of them don't. So a quadratic polynomial is irreducible, meaning cannot be factored, exactly when its discriminant is negative. Do you remember the discriminant b squared minus 4ac? So if b squared minus 4ac is negative, then the quadratic polynomial cannot be reduced. But if you have a cubic or a higher degree polynomial, then you can reduce it. If you have a cubic or higher degree polynomial, you can reduce it. You can imagine, for example, breaking a fourth degree polynomial into two quadratics. Now, do those quadratics break into smaller parts? Don't know. But, but the fourth degree polynomial will break into smaller parts. A cubic polynomial, for example, might break into a quadratic and a linear. A fifth degree polynomial might break into, oh, I don't know, a cubic and a quadratic. So you break these larger degree polynomials, at least in theory, you break these larger degree polynomials into smaller parts until you have a mix of linears and quadratics. The linears, you're done. The quadratics may or may not break depending on whether the discriminant is negative. So when you're factoring over the reals, you're always left with this situation where you, uh, you get it down close to completely factored bunch of linears, bunch of quadratics. Some of the quadratics will factor, but some of them won't. So you get it down close to completely factored, but not quite. So the reals have the disadvantage that you can't completely break. If you give me a polynomial, I cannot guarantee, well, I didn't say that right. I cannot guarantee that a given polynomial will factor completely into linears on the reals. So a polynomial with real coefficients factors into a, a product of linears and irreducible quadratics with real coefficients. And the factorization is unique. We haven't, haven't talked about that too much, but the two factorizations have the same factors raised to the same powers. But with complex numbers, the situation is perfect. With complex numbers, if, uh, if, if you have a polynomial like x squared plus 1, if you have a polynomial, you can break it completely into a product of linears. x squared plus 1 has no real roots, and so it doesn't factor over the real numbers. If you, if you imagine a root, if you add the possibility of the number i, so that i squared plus 1 equals 0, then x squared plus 1 factors into a product of two linears, x minus 1, i and x plus i. So it, it, what we do is we add this number i, sometimes engineers call it j, we add this number i to the reals, and then you close up the new system with respect to addition. That is, you allow yourself to say things like i plus i, or 3 plus i, or minus 2 plus 5i kind of stuff. And what you get is called the complex numbers, written that way with the, 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 called the blackboard bold face. Uh, capital C, because you can, with, with chalk on a blackboard, you could make that symbol. Usually, it, when a person sees complex numbers sometime in high school, they'll see uh, a person will, will 
picture them as uh, members of a plane so that the real part is, is plotted on the horizontal axis and the imaginary part, the, the coefficient of i, the imaginary part is plotted on the vertical axis and then in that context the distance of the point from the origin is you would write that of course with absolute value bars because that's how you ever denote the size of an object is the square root of a squared plus b squared. And the point about the complex numbers is that all quadratics factor, not just this one, all quadratics factor, that is in contrast with the reals, uh, uh, complex numbers has no irreducible quadratic, and summing it all up, what we get is that uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra with complex numbers, polynomials with complex coefficients, factor completely into linear polynomials with complex coefficients. The factorization is unique, but we're focused here on why did I switch from reals to complexes, and the answer is because you can completely factor polynomials. You haven't seen yet why I want to completely factor polynomials, but I do. You can completely factor polynomials if you use complex numbers. So complex numbers are a little more, shall we say, complex, but they have the advantage that, they, that polynomials completely factor. And we're going to be working with polynomials, so we're going to want to factor them. Okay? Okay, so what does this mean in terms of the linear algebra that we've been doing in the previous sections? And the answer is that we're going to have, for example, matrices. We won't see them very often for examples, but we could, in principle, see matrices with complex numbers as entries. I'm reminding a person up here how you add complex numbers is basically you add the real parts and you add the complex parts. Excuse me, I said that wrong. You add the real parts and you add the imaginary parts. Multiplication is, uh, it's not awful, but it's just slightly more complicated too. So A plus BI times C plus DI. So you do, we do what, at least in my high school, we call FOIL. You distribute. You take A times C, A times DI, and then you take BI times C and BI times DI, and you, you account for the fact that I times I is minus 1. You gather terms and you end up with AC minus BD, Look familiar? It looks like a determinant there. But anyway, AC minus BD and AD plus BC times I. So it's a slightly, it's kind of a slightly more involved operation, but it's pretty, from high school algebra, it's pretty much what you just, you do what you, you do. It just turns out to be more complicated here. Okay, now everything that, that we did before, we're going to carry over. And as an example, the standard basis for for the uh, for CN is uh, we're going to have that be a vector space over C, and I'll denote it with script E sub N, and you see it's one plus zero I. Um, I made the point that those are complex numbers, all the way out to one plus zero I in the last in the last entry. Okay, so all the stuff that we did before will carry over. We just simply are going to, at some point pretty soon, it must be pretty soon because we're coming to the end of the semester, at some point we're going to want to say, and then factor this polynomial, and we can't do that over the reals. We can't do that with confidence over the reals, so instead we've switched to working over the complex numbers. Okay, very good. So next time we'll start in, we're going to talk about a property called uh, similarity, and um, uh, that you know that'll start us on the uh, on the journey, finishing off here the last part of the course. So very good. Bye.